Hi guys, welcome to another podcast show of No Beef. Obviously, you know what we do here. We talk about racism across the board in Edinburgh, Glasgow, over Scotland. Today, I've got a special guest who's very popular in the black community in Scotland for us. Instead of me telling you his name, I'm going to let you let him introduce himself. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Marvin Bartley. Um, currently play for Livingston Football Club. Uh, been in Scotland for five years now, uh, hips for four years, and been at Livingston for one. And just on top of that, Marvin, are you enjoying playing football in Scotland? Yeah, I'm, I'm loving it, you know. Um, I'll be honest, when the, when the call first came to come up here, I wasn't too sure about it. Um, obviously, being a southern boy, kind of like yourself, uh, south of England, but, you know, I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Um, it's, it's been absolutely superb and probably one of the best football decisions you know I could have made so yeah I've really really enjoyed it that's good that's good um seeing you play for Hibs I've got so many friends that are Hibs fans and for me personally I was jubilant because I was like yes another black player playing for Hibs you know perfect and you know there's not many black people that have played in Scotland especially to this present day there are still some I know Rangers have a few which is good and it's good to see the SPL are being a bit more diverse um Talking about you playing in Scotland, and obviously you're a footballer, okay? Have you ever received experienced racism in Scotland? Um, yeah, on, on two occasions. Um, the first one I was playing in Edinburgh Derby, um, so obviously hit against Hearts, and I came off the pitch, looked at my social media because we'd won the game, and I'd received racial abuse um, from somebody who seemed to be a Hearts follower. Um, Kind of whenever I speak about racism coming towards me uh, within football, yeah. I never call them a supporter of that club because you know Hearts have black players, so can't be a supporter of that club and their black players are acceptable. But I'm not, so I'll call them a follower of football. Um, but yeah, there's some strong words. Um, I can't remember the exact wording of it now, but I kind of kind of made a joke in it in a sense that one of the words was, was sim- similar to Jambo, and I said to him, you know, when I read this, I thought you were calling me a Jambo. It, 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 Amongst all the other offensive words, I thought, you know what? Let me just kind of show this guy that he's not getting to me. Uh, yeah. Via social media. Yeah. And I thought, oh, you know, I thought you'd call me a jambo there, but I was mistaken. Um, but no, that, that, although I showed on social media, it didn't hurt. My reply showed that. Obviously, you know, it, it had hurt me and it had got to me, but I wasn't willing to show at that time to that, to that person or to anybody else who was looking in um, that it got to me. You know, uh, once you had went on notifications to check that and you saw that, and then when you realised what the person had said, you know, as a black man, I know how it feels. And I, I don't think people realise when they do say stuff like this, how it mentally and emotionally affects us. Can you just elaborate a little bit on, at that time when you it hurt you? I mean, did it cut deep? Or were you thinking, same old story? You know, what were you thinking? Uh, I, I, I definitely wasn't thinking same old story because I had never encountered anything but love um, up in Scotland, you know, from, from fans of, of, of other teams and especially, you know, Hibernian fans. Um, but when I, when I read it, I had to read it maybe four or five times for it to actually register um, because I couldn't understand, you know, first and foremost, why. You know, yeah. why I was writing this. Um, and it was it was so strange because... You know, looking through it and when I posted it and other people began to reply to it and speak to the guy before he deleted it, he said, oh, you know, I was playing really well in the game. He wanted to basically put me off. Now, you know, for, for anybody who doesn't watch football, you don't take your mobile phone on the football pitch. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, there was no chance I was seeing this message until after the match. That was his, his kind of, of reason for doing it. It doesn't make it acceptable. The words he used, never acceptable by anybody in any circumstances. Um... But yeah, you know, it was it was highly confusing uh, for me and, and 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 hugely disappointing because, as I said, you know, whether fans appreciate my style of play, whether they appreciate the team I play for, they don't. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's always good banter. It's never overstepped the mark. And you know, he was he was the first person to kind of really do that, and and it hurt, you know. But as I said, it, it wasn't. Say, I wasn't thinking say more because, as I said, moving up to Scotland, uh, people had their views on me coming up here as a black man and and how it would be for me. And, you know, it's, it's been the total opposite. And, and, and what I've realised, majority of these people saying what I was going to encounter in Scotland, I've never yeah. been to Scotland. You know, it's a lovely, lovely place. Um, honestly, I wouldn't still be up here if I didn't love the place and the people. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so yeah, you know that 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 incident it, incident definitely hurt, but it wasn't it wasn't a, a me thinking oh same old same old. I'm I'm glad you touched on that you you you, you encountered what people were saying for you to come up to Scotland because you know I moved to Scotland in 1998 and yeah. in my neighbourhood my family was the only black family and then you had to walk probably 20 minutes up the road for another black family and. Yeah. I think that mindset of Scotland is still the template of black people from London. Um, unless they have family in Scotland and they do come up and visit. Um, so it does make me happy that when you say you've enjoyed your time in Scotland because you know Scotland is a lovely country. Um, it's a very beautiful, scenic, cultured country. And especially in Edinburgh, you know, um, the big smoke as everyone says, the capital. So it does, it does make me happy you say that. Do you feel that Playing for Hibs at the time when you came to Scotland, do you think that was a massive help for you to learn the culture, to see what the Scots are all about, to see what it was like for a black South Londoner to live in Edinburgh? Definitely. Um, you know, without that Hibs coming in for me and that opportunity coming about, I, I would never have came to Scotland. You know, not, not for football, but not for anything. You know, I'd never stepped foot in the country prior to this. Um, so, yeah, you know, playing for Hibs and having an opportunity and, and, and being able to see the country was, was massive for me, not only as a, as a footballer, but as a person. Yeah. Because, you know, now when I speak about Scotland, I speak about it so passionately because I, I thoroughly enjoy this country. You know, it's a brilliant, brilliant country, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant people. And, you know, maybe if I hadn't came, came up here and another player was saying they were coming to Scotland, I would have been the same as everybody else, you know, who hasn't yeah. been up here and said, oh, you know, I heard up there's racist, you know, I heard this is racist. You know, people are saying these things about ever coming to the country and that, that, that's what hurts me most. So when I go back, I have nothing but positive things to say. And now, and now some of my friends would have never came up here or been up here. And they're like, wow, like Scotland's amazing. Like, Edinburgh's amazing. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? And, and, and that's, this is the whole thing about educating, you know? And, 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 you know, I've been able to educate some of my friends because I've lived in the city, you know, I, I'm still here, I'm still in Scotland, lovely place. And I've managed to educate, let's say 10 or 15 other people who've, came up here who never came. And now when they have conversations with their friends, it's a knock-on effect, it's a domino effect, you know? Um, so, so talking about racism, it kind of works in both ways. People will say, no, oh, you're going to encounter it in Scotland when I've, I've had more racist incidents in England than Scotland. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, education is a key thing. On the top, on, on that education, you know, like you said, it is a key thing. I agree with you because what we're taught in schools I still, even with racism, I feel doesn't still prepare us for life itself. And mm -hmm. when it comes to racism, we're not really taught anything about racism. Yes, we're taught what's wrong, what's right. Yet, when people go back to their households, how their parents have brought them up, their heritage, their other older generations of way of speaking, unfortunately, some households still see you and me as beneath them, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, they're black, they're not like us, you know, they're mm -hmm. not on our level, they don't deserve to be here. And, you know, for you playing in Scotland, for young black football players in, in Scotland and Edinburgh, Glasgow, wherever, you are an inspiration and, you know, it's very monumental who you are to us because we see you as this black guy that plays football in a white dominated league, in a white dominated country, and you're excelling. So it shows to us that we are being represented. And I think that, do you think that education is a must regarding racism from young age to older generations before us? How would you tackle that? Like well, you said, education, and I've said it as well, is key. Um, but do you know what's more important than in the schools? Like you touched on that at home, you know, because you're in school for you know, a minimal amount of time, you know, you, you, whoever you live with, you know, like say your grandparents, let's be honest, you know, kind of older generations probably, I still hear people saying, you know, oh, that colored person. Yeah. And that's, that's not them being racist. They just don't understand that, you know, I'm not, I'm black. You know, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, not a problem with calling me black. So that, that there isn't a, them being racist. It's just what, you know, when they were younger, it was, oh, a colored person. And, and that's the way of putting it politely, you know, but, it's fine. Don't, don't be offended to call me black. I'm a black man. That's that, that's no problem at all. Um, so yeah, education is key, and, and it's it's up to you know kind of the younger ones maybe to educate the older ones. You know, if you if you do hear your grandparent or you know somebody a bit older say, 
like I said, coloured person, say, no, no, um, no, granddad, that, that's, that's a black person, that's fine to say it, they're, they're black, yeah. they're not coloured, yeah. and, that's, and, and, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but yeah, more can be done in schools, more can always be done in schools, but that work that schools do can quickly be undone at home. So, you know, let's get our own houses in order first before we start pointing the fingers at, you know, schools to do better. Let's do better within our, within our own, own households. Um, and that will allow us to, to move forward, you know, uh, more long term, you know. Things being done in school can be short term, as I said, because it can quickly be undone when you get home. You know, you're there from nine till three. If you have an hour history lesson a week or, you know, two hours a week yeah. and you're learning about all these different, when you go home, you know, you're, you're spending from, say, let's four till you go to bed at half ten or whatever you're hearing a lot of racist language within that. that, that stuff at school is going to be quickly undone. Yeah, um, it becomes casual, doesn't it? It becomes casual, yeah. becomes a norm for their tongue for them to speak like that. So if their parents are speaking like that or their grandparents, they feel, oh, that is the norm. Mm-hmm. You know, so we do need, yeah. we do need to tackle that. Um, going towards your time at Hibs and also your time there at Livingston, when you walked into the dressing room, how were you perceived as? Do you think people looked at you like, oh, who's this black guy? Or did people think, oh, nice to meet you, Marvin. How, did, how, did, how were you perceptive? How were you received? I, I'm always asked that question. And, and for me, the, the, the best way for me to describe it is that, you know, I've never walked into a changing room and thought people have said, you know, oh, here's a black man, you know, walk into his dressing room. Um, and that probably speaks volumes because I've never even thought of that you know, because it's never been an experience. I walk in, I'm, I'm, a, I'm Marvin Bartley, I, I play centre midfield or holding midfield, you know, whatever age I was when I signed, maybe 29, what team I came from. That, that's all that's important. You know, it's like somebody uh, asked me the other day, um, have you ever been within a team that you're the only black player? And I had yeah. to actually think about it because I've never got, I don't go into a change room and say, if you said to me, oh, how many white players were at when you signed? I couldn't tell you. If yeah. you said to me, name the boys who were there, I could reel them all off. Mm-hmm. The reserve team as well. Because that's what I don't see skin colour. I see them, you know, as teammates, first and foremost, when I first walked, walked in, and now lifelong friends. And I don't see their skin colour, and I hope they don't see the, you know, see me as be like the first thing that when they hear Marvin Bartley, they think black man. I, I, do you know what I mean? I don't think they, that they think that. You know, if we're talking about football, they'll talk about, you know, what I'm good at, what I'm bad at. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I never, I never, never felt like walking into the hip dressing room. Never felt that walking to the Livingston dressing room and I'll be honest I've, I've never ever felt that walking to any dressing room but that might just be my mindset you know yeah that might just be the way I'm set up as a person you know I, I I don't really react to those sorts of things if they are going on in and around me maybe I have my blinkers on but you know I could never ever sit here and say you know I, the first thing that they thought was oh here comes a black man I'm never at all um, um that that makes me happy and smile because you know um playing football in Scotland you know um you don't, as a black person, you don't know, that's not your fault. You just want to go in and press, make sure you, you do what you can to start on the Saturday or the Sunday um, and just prepare mentally, prepare physically. So it is good and it's so satisfying and refreshing. That, and I hope the young black football players that are watching this and listening that, you know, to be mentally strong is good. Don't think I'm the only black person here. Be like, I'm going to impress. I'm going to do my job. And do you know, the majority of white people in Scotland are not racist. I'm not saying here that white people are racist, Scottish people are racist. No. Unfortunately, we deal with a certain group that are racist. And for me, I'm happy that your time in Scotland has been successful, has been positive, And obviously, you're still here, you know? So you must be doing a good job. Do you know what I mean? Just going to put it out there, I don't think him should have let you go. I think him should have kept you on. But <laughs> story. Um, Black Lives Matter. Mm-hmm. When you see Black Lives Matter, when you hear Black Lives Matter, what's your thoughts? What's your feeling? It's, it's, it's a proud movement um, by everybody. Um, I think it's so important that we're all standing together, you know, non-racist against the racist kind of thing. Um, and I think, you know, it's definitely gathered pace as it's gone on. You know, it's, it wasn't kind of, oh, we're here one day and gone the other. You know, mm-hmm. people are continuously trying to do things to to bring equality. Yeah. Um, and that's the most important thing, you know. I think when people start saying, you see post social media at the moment so toxic for it, and um, people saying kind of all lives matter. Totally agree. You know, all lives do matter. But what we're what we're asking for is everyone's life to matter the same. You know, we're not we're not asking to 
to, to be better than anybody else. You just want to be the same, you want to be viewed the same. And, you know, I was having a conversation just the other day uh, with, with somebody. And, and again, this has opened up great conversations just about life. Matter. I mean, with the boys I've played football with, you know, we've, I've had conversations with, and we don't always agree. Like our opinions are sometimes different, but it's good. The conversation's there. That's know, what we're we want. Each other. Exactly. We're educating each other. And, you know, we were talking, and I said to him, you know, because he was kind of saying, I don't really see it. See it as that. And I said, okay, that's fair. I said, let me put this to you then. I said, we're flying to America. We're going to America for two weeks. Tomorrow we're going we're gonna to leave. Me and you go together. And as you're on the plane, I say to you, right, let's swap skin colours for the next two weeks. Would you do it? Instantly said no. And then he said, oh. And I said, exactly. I said, now, now you kind of see what, what I'm saying. Yeah. Now you can kind of see what I'm saying. You don't want to swap. You, you keep everything else about yourself, your mind, your height, your looks, everything. Just swap skin colour. And you don't want to do it. And why? And you know what he said to me? I don't think I'll be safe there. I said, imagine that. I said, imagine that. The only reason you don't want to swap skin colour is because you don't believe you'll be safe in a country. I would never go to America right now. Never, ever. No. You know? it, 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 and how sad is that? 2020 and we're sitting here, you know, doing stuff like this over Zoom. The world's moved on so much and we're saying, I wouldn't go to America. You know, someone said to me, if one of your friends passed away in America, not for anything racial, passed away, would you go to the funeral? I said, no, I wouldn't feel safe. How mad is that? Would not feel safe to go to a country, you know? And, well, and that kind of brings it up. I have mm. to agree with you because, um, you know, I have a wife, I have a, we have a son, and, you know, I have cousins in mm. um, across the States. And they just told me, one of my cousins just told me that they're pregnant, you know? They're having a baby. And, like, I cried because I was so happy for him and his wife. At the same time, I was just like, you're bringing a black child up in America and right now, I don't want to get emotional, but right now it's horrible. You know, mm. it's, it's so hard to be black and then imagine raising a child to bring into this mess, you know, and, and it's like you said, it's, it's not safe because um, it's horrible right now for, for people because of the way we look, mm. we're not safe. In 2020, where <laughs> Probably we should be living in a country where security should be one of the main things, but ourselves, people like ourselves, women as well, won't go to America. And you know, yeah. it's a shame because obviously there's so many uh, vacational places to go to visit. Obviously the weather, the foods and stuff, and their culture. But unfortunately, I don't want to risk my life. When I come back, yeah. you know, yeah. one of my cousins was getting married and he's moved it to next year and. In Dallas, and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, Stanley, I don't know if I'm going to come because am I going to be able to come back after two weeks, you know? My wife, who is half Algerian, she's North African, she automatically said, I'm not going. Yeah. You know? That's North African, but to people this year as an Arab, or do you know what yeah. I mean? Stuff like that. So both counts. So you know what yeah. I'm saying? Um, I think 2020 um, has been... Uh, I don't even know the word to describe the year. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, all the killings in America. But let's not forget the killings in London previously and um, in Scotland. So I think change is coming, slowly coming. And that's why I created this podcast, to hear people's views. No beef, that's why I call it. Because you might, we might not agree, but it's to listen to each other, yeah. educate. And the term you use there with the airplane, that's powerful, man, because he wasn't he wouldn't want to swap with you. Yeah. And, and then so he, that makes him socially aware that he knows that if I was black, I wouldn't be safe here. Yeah. And then that's the great thing, like I say, it's it's sparking up conversations, you know, you're having these conversations because we wouldn't have me and him wouldn't have had this conversation, you know, six months ago. No. And don't get me wrong, somebody's lost not somebody, a lot of people have lost their lives. Yeah, and it's so it's taken that, but let's try and get some positives out of it, you know. And, and like I said, these kind of conversations are are a huge positive. And another thing that's so important is that not all Americans are again tired of the same brush because you know I, I know a lot of Americans who are great, great people. You know, yeah, so it's so sad that I won't go to their country because I don't feel safe, and it's not because I don't feel safe because of them; it's because of, of a small minority, but also the police, the people who are supposed to protect you. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and that's, that's so sad because you've got people there and, 
you know, there's people I speak to over there and, and they're truly hurt. You know, one of my old teammates is now playing over there. He said, I cannot believe what's going on. You know, the, the police are stopping people of colour wanting to come here. You know, and that's, that, that in itself is it, it, crazy. And, and thank God it's the opposite in Scotland. You know, I've, I've um, you know, as I said, we spoke earlier about the kind of two racist incidents I had. The second one that we didn't touch on was when a guy recorded me uh, when I was playing for, for Hibs at Tynecastle in Edinburgh Derby again. Yeah. And called me, um, you know, an awful lot of uh, racist words. I know it. I read about it. I read about yeah. it. Yeah. It really you know what, what, re reading it is painful, hearing it. It's heartbreaking. It's probably the worst, the worst racial video I've I've viewed, and it was it was directed at me. And you know what? From the from the first day of the police getting it to the last day of him going to court, the police were absolutely fantastic. I don't have the, honestly, they were absolutely brilliant. The two people who dealt with the case, you know, the specialists they brought in to to link his Snapchat to his Facebook to his Twitter, yeah. brilliant. But still, at the end of the day, you know, after. That person recording themselves racially abusing me, they walk free from court. They were not proven. Now, that, now, now that's the problem. If you can record yourself, but not have your face in it, of you racially abusing somebody and still walk out of a courtroom. What does that you know, tell you about the stuff, it's, right? That, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not really going to improve. Uh, the only other thing he could have done was flipped it onto his face and flipped it back to me. You know, yeah. and maybe they still would have found the technicality. Um, but to have a link to all your other social medias, people saying that is definitely his voice. When the video is played in the courtroom, his own mother to walk out because she doesn't want to hear it. And then after the court case, you know, members of his family to message me, and I would never ever screenshot his messages and put them out there. But me yeah. members of his family message me, you know, a couple of, I'll be honest, created fake accounts to do so, and they said, we're so sorry that this has happened. You know, we're, we're so ashamed to have him in our family. But they've got to protect him first and foremost, because. You know, he's probably looking at a prison sentence. Yeah. You know, for doing that if found guilty. And it's funny because well, it's not funny, but someone runs on the pitch at Easter Road, a hips fan, pushes James Tavernier, pushes him, or the ball brushes against him, gets hundred yep. days in prison. Somebody racially abuses somebody and video records it, walks free of not proven. So, you know, until we start to sort it out at the top, will any difference be made? Us as a community, us as people will make a difference. The police are trying their utmost, and this is what really frustrates me when people start saying oh, but the police aren't doing a good enough job. Listen, I've been in there with them. You know, they did as much as they possibly could. You know, they went above and beyond to get this person prosecuted. Mm -hmm. But the final hurdle is then out of their hands. That just, that, you know, I think that's why a lot of racial incidents aren't reported. Mm. Um, I was, last year I was dropping my wife off um, in town and an elderly gentleman called me a black bastard. And I wasn't even in his lane. He just looked at me and he just shouted black bastard. So I took, I took a picture of the, his license plates, called the police, um, explained the situation. They said, no problem, we'll take the details. A gentleman came up to me and said, look, I saw that, please use my name. It's been 12 months, never heard a thing. So for me, our society, our community, sorry, have the attitude of, what can you do? It happens. But this is why I want this podcast, because no, that shouldn't be the case. You know, change has to be, has to be put in place that no one should feel brave enough or bold enough to say that in public, knowing there's no um, consequences. Because if I or you were speaking very loud and aggressive towards anyone mm -hmm. and it was reported we would be arrested we would be detained mm -hmm. okay we'll be probably we'll probably go to court mm -hmm. you know and there's a 85 90 percent chance we'll have a sentence or we'll be punished okay mm -hmm. now on the back of that loss of employment loss of earnings okay because we acted like that however i feel that some white people in the world are so bold enough and brave enough because they know systematically that nothing's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. I'll just deny it, you know? You know? Um, Marvin, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you are really, really appreciated. Um, I know you're a busy guy, um, so I appreciate for you coming on. Hi, Bobby. Come, come, Bobby. Come. 
Marvin, my son's decided to come on. <laughs> <laughs> you okay? Hello. Hello, you okay? This is Billy <laughs> Junior, Marvin. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> say hello. <laughs> Marvin, as I, as I said, thank you so much for coming on the No Beef podcast. Yeah. Guys, it's safe to say that there's no beef between me and Marvin. Uh, thank you for listening and looking for the podcast. Yeah.